Uh, welcome to the Protection and Management Week webinar. Uh, my name is Simon Naudi. I'm going to be uh, uh, instructing you or guiding you through the next little uh, session. And uh, in terms of um, the agenda, we're going to have a number of speakers there, as you can see. Um, and what I hope to try to do is to talk you through um, the bits that I'm going to cover, which is pr predominantly um, the main areas that you guys can benefit from, i.e. before, during, and after um, the show. Now, um, primarily the thing I look at is uh, you can visit any show you like, and you can see often two exhibitors separated by no more than two meters of carpet, and one of them is very busy and one of them is very quiet. And the question I ask is, well, what makes one of them very quiet and one of them very busy when they've both paid the same amount of money to be there? So hopefully, um, as a result of some of the tips I'm going to try and go through, uh, yours will be the stand that is actually quite busy. Um, I'd like to start off first by referring to uh, FaceTime, uh, which was a, a research uh, piece of work set up by the Association of Event Organizers. Uh, and what effectively FaceTime were trying to do was to establish how well or how badly uh, events performed versus all the other media. Um, and, and they looked at a certain number of things, predominantly generation of leads, uh, persuasiveness, and also conversion of those leads. Now, their actual findings extended to about three pages uh, of information, but the, the summary points are as follows. Uh, the majority, 80%, felt that face-to-face -face delivered a much better return than other media. 86% uh, believed it was the second best at generating leads after a company's own website. And 87% uh, felt it was not only easier to communicate with people face-to-face, but 80% felt that they actually spent more money once they had that face-to-face -face interaction. So clearly, we know that if you had to sort of summarize the, the findings that have been carried out, uh, we know that it remains one of the best ways to try and increase uh, your own business. Now, in terms of the exhibition itself, um, one of the things to, to think about is, is the perception of the visitor that's important. And clearly, uh, it's those first impressions that count. At the moment, the visitor takes one look at you and you people on your stand, they form an overall first impression. Uh, and that impression basically says, yes, let's go and talk to them, or actually, no, let's uh, give them a wide berth. Uh, and, and in terms of how much time you've got, it's not actually a huge amount. They believe that in terms of first impressions, you've only got somewhere in the region of about 10 to 12 seconds. Because 10 to 12 seconds is about the average length of time it takes the average visitor to walk past the average stand. Now, um, they'll be looking at how you stand and, and you know, open body language, closed body language. They'll be looking for eye contact. They'll be looking for smiles. And, and they'll look looking at your own behaviors. But clearly, they're also going to be catching some of the messaging and imaging that you'll have on your stand. Now, my intention is not to go through a whole lexography of things that you could or couldn't do, but really just to highlight a couple of words that I've seen on my visits to the various shows. Um, the first word I'd like to draw your attention to is the word cheap. And again, you see a lot of people doing sort of special cheap offers and so on. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if I ask you the question, uh, imagine something is cheap, what's the first thing that goes through your mind? So it's probably sort of cheap and nasty, uh, low quality or poor quality. And I can't actually imagine that you'd like to go around boasting that you own anything that's cheap. You don't even want a cheap bin liner because, you know, you put stuff in it, you lift it up, and slot it goes all over your feet. So clearly, uh, one of the problems with the word cheap is the connotations it has. Uh, imagine, for example, I said I have got a cheap Rolex for you. Uh, one of three things goes through your mind. It's a fake, uh, it's broken, or it belongs to somebody else. Uh, and, and that's about it, really. So it's about thinking of the, the power or the connotations that these words have. Uh, another one that marketing departments all over the world bombard us with uh, is the word free. And again, um, you know, if I say to you something is free, what's the first thing that goes through your mind? Well, chances are it's free, I mean, there's a catch. Where's the catch? What's the catch? Now imagine it was free and there is no catch. What's the next thing to go through your mind? Well, yeah, it's probably worthless. Uh, if it can be that good, why are they giving it away? So again, beware of free offers. You know, think about what happens when you, um, you, you realize that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, and if you can see the catch up front, it works. So, for example, buy one, get one free. Well, that works because the catch is you've got to buy one in order to get one free. The problem with the word free on its own right is that actually it has no worth or value attached to it. Um, and, and clearly, when people do want to say something is free, that's not the word that they use. You know, you imagine you're going on an airline and they give you an upgrade to first class. They don't go, oh, Mr. Naudi, have a free upgrade. You know, you stay in a hotel, they don't say, oh, have a, a free upgrade to, uh, you know, an executive suite or have a free upgrade to. They don't give you a free breakfast or a free newspaper. They will use the word it's complimentary because, again, a complimentary upgrade or a complimentary night uh, is actually implying there's a value attached. 
Um, uh, and actually it means the same as free without any of those negative connotations. So the, the, the caution or the tip here is you know, beware of your graphics because sometimes there can be hidden connotations. The way to look at your, um, your participation in the show is to think about your own objectives in terms of what are you trying to achieve. Um, and clearly there are three parts to this. Firstly, I would say your own objectives in terms of why you're there. You need to consider the visitors' objectives in terms of why they visit and what they expect to see. And in a way, those two first factors there determine your role. Now, I'd like to give you an example, if I might. Let's imagine that you decide this year your objective at going to the show is a big data capture exercise. And you decide that you're after recruiting and getting as many names, addresses, and, and phone numbers as possible. So you think, right, we need a device to get lots and lots of people onto our stand. So you decide that what you're going to do this time around is offer yourselves um, uh, or, or your visitors free coffee and free tea. So you build the barista area at the back of your bar, and everything's hunky-dory, and it's all professionally done. The doors open, and within seconds of the doors opening, there is this enormous queue of people outside your stand. And you think, whoa, wow, fantastic, what a result. Now, the problem with that is just think about what actually happens to those people when you analyze the amount of time. Now, in terms of time, imagine they're in the queue for five minutes. And once they, they get to the front of the queue to make a decent cup of coffee, let's say it takes another five minutes. So they get their coffee. It's a bit too hot to drink. It might take five minutes to cool down. Then they need to drink their coffee, and that might take five minutes. Now, then they can't at that point decide, oh, I'm going to leave, because that looks like I only came for the free coffee, so I'll pretend I'm interested for another five minutes. And suddenly, one visitor has taken 20, 25 minutes of your time. So clearly, remember, if your initial objective was to see as many people as quick as possible, then corporate hospitality is not the way to go. Now, whilst on the point of objectives, we need to understand why you're there. And one of the things that I tend to do uh, is I tend to visit a large number of shows, uh, whether they're trade or consumer shows, and uh, I'll grab people at random off their stand and I'll ask them a very simple, straightforward question, why are you here? Because I'm, I'm quite interested in why people exhibit. Now, what follows next, ladies and gentlemen, in uh, true Miss World order, i.e. reverse order, are the four most frequent responses um, that I've received when I ask the question, why are you here? So in fourth place, the, the response is, because it's my turn. Couldn't come last year, but yeah, it's my turn this year. Okay, worryingly, in third place, the reason I'm given is because somebody was sick and I was wheeled in as a last-minute replacement. Um, and again, you know, it's, it happens fairly frequently. In second place, uh, networking, of course. Uh, I'm there and I'm going to get networked to a complete stupor with my clients. It's going to be fantastic. Um, but more worryingly, the top answer that I get to that question is, I don't know, I've no idea, uh, because somebody in marketing booked it, uh, because we always come, because our competitors are here, because, because... And I think, well, actually, maybe my question, why are you here, is a little bit ambiguous. And maybe I ought to ask a more serious question, more specific question, which is, what is your objective in exhibiting? Well, again, in, in sort of reverse order, my two most frequent responses, by frequently. Um, first, uh, second place, uh, the, the answer I get is, I'm just trying to survive. I'm just trying to get through the next three days. And it's almost like people see it as an inconvenience. Um, and they say, oh, you know, I've got to go to the show and everything's on hold, I've got to put my active office on. And actually they miss the whole point that during the two, three days of your event, you can probably achieve an awful lot more than it could two or three months either side of it. But perhaps the most scary thing is my number one response uh, in terms of objectives is to give away brochures. And they'll say, oh, it was a fantastic show. We ran out of brochures within the first 12 minutes, or we ran out of business cards in half an hour. It was great. Well, I guess in the absence of any other metric, giving away brochures is probably uh, a good enough metric. But in fairness, not really the one that we're looking for. Uh, and I guess, folks, at this point, it's worth your while um, spending a little bit of time thinking about your own objectives in terms of you know, what are your objectives at this event? What are you trying to achieve by being there? Now, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are a, a broad range of objectives um, across the audience, and I'm sure if you asked everybody individually, you'd get a, a broad spread of potential um, objectives. Um, from experience, the most frequent ones that I receive when I ask people to do an exercise a bit like that are as follows. Uh, typically, they're either trying to launch uh, new products or, or new services uh, and show a new range. They're there possibly because they want to test the market and just check out response. Uh, it could well be that they're trying to promote their own image in terms of branding. Um, often, they're there to assess the competition, check out the competition, see what they're up to, uh, and, and clearly um, to meet specific buyers. Now, that could be you know, new clients. It could be existing clients. It could be a mix of the two. Uh, it could be buyers with a budget over a certain amount, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that these are sort of the typical uh, objectives that most people come up with. And actually, they are all significantly better than giving away brochures or trying to get through the next few days. 
What I would encourage you to try to do, if you want a sort of quantum leap in your performance at this year's event, is to, to formulate what I would call real objectives. In other words, rather than just go for general objectives, I would, and, and these are just arbitrary numbers, but I would try and say, try and get, let's say, 12 leads for follow-up, or three direct sales, if that's appropriate, uh, or make, you know, 25 inqu appointment inquiries, or, um, because actually all the PR and publicity you'll get by being there will happen as a consequence of being there. But at least this way, you've got a way of assessing how well how badly you are performing at any one time. Now, you know, let's imagine arbitrarily you have said we wish to make 18 appointments, and you actually make 18 on your first day, then clearly don't be scared to adjust your uh, objectives. Uh, and at least that way you can come back next year and go, right, we know as long as we get three new bits of business or one new bit of business, we've paid for our stand and we've made some profit. So, uh, again, you will know what those numbers need to be, but it's certainly worth having a discussion around those. The other thing I'd also advise you to do yeah, is, is less is more. You know, the fewer objectives you have, the greater the chance you've got of uh, realizing them. So uh, without going over, over the top, I just want to sort of summarize that first section. Number one, I would say, is agree those objectives. Make sure that everybody understands why you're there. Uh, ideally, refine them and make them as specific as you can so they fit in with the corporate objectives. And, and possibly the most important part of that is make sure you communicate it to everybody else who's on your stand. Um, uh, one of the, the, the problems is that not everybody understands why you're there, and everybody can have a separate agenda. This way, you're all singing from the same hymn sheet, and hopefully uh, your results will be much more impressive. Now, if we start thinking about our visitors for a second, um, wouldn't it be nice if there were such a thing as robo-visitor? Uh, and, and we had an ideal profile. You know, they were male, they were age 43, they had a budget of, da 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 da, da. Um, and, and all of this is actually great, um, except that often they don't. Um, you know, we, we do some work, for example, with the boat show, and the problem that some of these uh, vendors of super yachts have is they can't tell whether the chap in the corner with the hole in his jumper is actually an eccentric millionaire or just a sort of uh, a vagrant. Uh, and actually, that's part of the problem. So what we do have, however, is a way of identifying, through research that's been done, lots of information in terms of visitors and what they like and dislike about attending a show. Now, I've got some information for you, which, uh, again, I'm not going to spend too much on, but just think about the fact that reasons why people come is because they're looking for advice or they're looking for uh, a bit more research, they want to meet people, uh, and this is sort of the picture for the consumer, but also uh, a very similar picture emerges for a trade event as well. So, again, you can see that there are a mix of reasons that people turn up uh, to these events. What I would say is from all the research that's been done, the latest uh, information suggests that the number one reason that people will visit an event is typically to find out what's new or what's the latest position. Um, and the second reason they'll come is because they want to try and find a solution to an existing problem. Now, again, that might be in the back of their head, um, and actually once they start engaging with you in the conversation, they go, oh, I wonder, do you do such and such? And suddenly uh, you've now got yourselves uh, a, a prospect. In terms of dislikes, whilst there's a large number of them, the main thing they dislike is being sold to. They hate pushy salespeople pouncing on them uh, and, and trying to give them a hard time. Uh, and the second aspect, I guess, is they ask a question and they don't know what the right answer is. Or the person who knows the answer isn't here today, can you come back tomorrow? Or, you know, they're having lunch, can you come back in an hour? And, and the simple fact is that the visitor doesn't come back, or at least they'll come back having been hijacked by one of your competitors, which is the last thing that you guys want. Um, one of the things to bear in mind as well, folks, is uh, the so-called sort of body language aspect. We know, for example, in terms of communication, about 7% of what you say is conveyed by the words. A lot more of it is in terms of the meaning, uh, and clearly the balance without being a mathematician uh, is what the uh, Americans would call body talk or body language to you and I. So clearly, uh, how you stand, uh, open posturing, smiling, all those things are, are very positive in terms of uh, encouraging people to come onto your stand. And, and the key clearly here is to be able to identify from the overall number of visitors who actually uh, walk through the hall, how many of them have potential, and the ones that do have potential, how can you engage with them? Now, what I've tried to do is to engage, is to sort of almost put together my frequently asked questions, if you like, about do's and don'ts, things that work typically uh, with most events. Uh, and, and what I hope to try to do is to cover off the most common questions that I get asked. So the first question typically uh, people ask is, you know, do we and should we wear a uniform? Uh, by uniform, I don't mean peak cap and gold braid. What I mean is, should we all look the same? And the answer is a very definite yes, you should. If you're all going to be wearing black or you're all going to be wearing blue, then everybody should be wearing black or everybody should be wearing blue. You don't have a mix. You don't have black with a fleck or black with a stripe. The look must be uniform. Uh, the reason for this, folks, is simply that people will get confused. Uh, if I walk onto your stand and you two are dressed, let's say, differently, I've got no idea as a visitor whether you both work on the same stand or whether one of you is a visitor. 
if I walk onto your stand and interrupt you, then the risk is I'm going to look quite stupid. So rather than put myself in that position, uh, I'd rather not come and approach you at all. So again, clearly, if it's very obvious that you both work on the same stand, I'm much more likely to come and approach you. Um, we also know that stands have a habit of uh, uh, progressively getting trashed as the day unfolds. So again, you've got no control of what time your key prospect or prospects walk past your stand. So make sure that you've got some mechanic there uh, in order to try and maintain it uh, in a clean and tidy state. So you know, clear away the, the coffee cups, the newspapers, umbrellas, and things that typically pile up during the day. Uh, and do make sure that your stand remains functional. You know, clearly, if something isn't working, don't be scared to move it. Now, uh, the other big error I get asked about is gimmicks. You know, should we have a gimmick, and, and, and does it work? And, and the most common gimmick, I suppose, is a cardboard box with a slot at the top, uh, and people sort of put in their business card and win champagne or salmon or whatever it happens to be. And the question I get asked is, do these things work? And the answer is yes, a resounding yes. They work brilliantly at getting names and addresses of people who like to drink champagne or eat salmon. Not necessarily names and addresses of people that are going to become potential clients of yours. The idea, therefore, folks, is if you are going to run a gimmick, ideally try to make sure that your prize is something that will only appeal to the type of person that you try to achieve. So, again, clearly here, if you put on you know, an iPad or an iPhone or an MP3 player, well, everybody wants one of those, so you're going to get lots and lots of business cards from people who are simply interested in winning the prize, as opposed to winning whatever it is that you guys have on offer. And, and the other area, I guess, folks, is if you, you have to have a brochure, think about how you're going to vend your brochures. We looked at a, a number of ways of vending uh, brochures. Uh, we looked at freestanding literature racks. We looked at a pile of brochures. We looked at a fanned out display. Um, and, and, and the idea is we, we found that some of them were much better uh, than others. Clearly, the most ineffective, and the thing I would never advise you to do, is to have a neatly fanned display. Um, you know, this is OCD. You don't actually need it. Uh, it doesn't look as good as you think it does, and actually stresses out the visitor because they're worrying about which side to take one from without upsetting the display. Um, the next most efficient, uh, efficient way was actually just to have a pile of brochures. And the problem with the pile is that the visitor wasn't sure whether this was your personal stock or whether they were allowed to help themselves. Um, the next most effective was the freestanding niche racks and the wall-mounted racks, and they were fine up until you were down to your last one or two. And at that point, people were sort of stressing out about taking the last one from any, any rack. So again, as long as they're well stocked out, they do work uh, quite well. Um, as you'd expect, folks, I've tried to put together a list of do's and don'ts for you, uh, and, and these are probably the most common ones. Uh, do make sure you have lots of shifts and breaks. Again, typically what happens is people get hungry at lunchtime, and that's the time when you potentially risk having an empty stand. So you can make sure that there's always somebody uh, at hand. Ideally, try and be natural, and by this I mean two things. One, don't buy a brand new pair of shoes, because they will kill your feet. Uh, but, but number two, I'm thinking, let's imagine you decide that you're going to um, turn up suited and booted, and you've got somebody who works for you who doesn't normally wear a suit. No matter how many Hugo Boss Armani labels you give them, they will still look like somebody who doesn't normally wear a suit wearing a suit. So again, try and play to your strengths and your forte. Um, also, it's a good tip to try and look busy. Now, there's two types of busy. There's good busy and bad busy. Uh, good busy, I guess, is um, the type where it looks like it's possible to interrupt you. Bad busy looks like where you'd be upset. So uh, examples of bad busy would be things like sitting down, having a sandwich, reading a magazine. Uh, good busy would be tidying up leaflets, uh, getting rid of newspapers, coffee cups, and so on. Uh, and again, it's, sort of, it's common sense, but not common practice. Also, folks, I'd encourage you to think about questions. Um, the problem with questions is that most people, if they don't think about them, will ask the most obvious question in the world, which is, can I help you? To which the answer is typically, no thanks, just looking. So the sort of questions I'm really thinking about here are questions like, how familiar are you with our products and services? Or, you know, what plans do you currently have? Because, again, these are the sorts of questions that will give you a lot more information. The problem with these questions is they're not what I would call first-line questions. You can't stand on, your, on the edge of your stand and ask one of these questions. You need an icebreaker. You know, how's it going? You know, why did you come to the show? What are you after? And then, so, how familiar are you with the products and services on the show? Uh, as with any list of do's, there's obviously a list of don'ts. So, very briefly, what I would say is, number one, don't hover, glide, or pounce. Um, you know, visitors are humans, they're not sort of prey uh, to be stalked, and, and, and hunting, again, is a, a perennial favorite. Um, again, good advice would be generally do not eat, drink, or, or smoke, if you can these days, on your stand, um, primarily not because I'm anti-eating or anti-drinking, it's just that they typically are examples of bad busy, but also tend to create mess. Um, and again, uh, in terms of you know, professionalism, it's not a good look. Um, this list is not exhaustive, but, but please don't sit down. And even if you've got chairs built into your stand, don't use them because it looks like you're on your break. 
uh, and certainly don't you know read newspapers or use mobile phones or, or whatever else, hold meetings with your colleagues just because it's quiet. Um, clearly, it doesn't apply to any of you guys listening, but um, manning a stand with a hangover is the devil's own work, and that's just the, the voice of personal experience. And likewise, they shouldn't be able to detect the flavor of curry you had the night before. Now, my next point, folks, is do remember to follow up your leads. Uh, and before I, I mention this point, I always used to feel quite guilty saying to people, don't forget to follow up your leads, because to me that was actually quite obvious. There was some research done by the Association of Event Organizers where they asked people like yourselves, exhibitors, how many of you guys admitted to following up your leads correctly or incorrectly? Uh, and there was a whole raft of questions asked, but a certain percentage admitted to not following up their leads. Uh, if I told you that figure was about 10%, it would be quite worrying. If I told you it was 20%, it would be much, much worse. If I told you it was double that at 40%, it would be quite scandalous. If I told you it was at least 50%, it would be very, very worrying. In fact, the exact figure was a lot more than 50%. The exact figure to admit not following up their leads was a whopping 75% of people. Now, to me, the whole point of going is to have some leads that you can then follow up, especially at the moment, folks, in a, uh, you know, coming out of the worst recession in history, um, you certainly need to be in a position where you are following up your leads correctly. Um, in terms of follow-up, uh, whether you use light pens, scanners, barcodes, handheld palm tops, bits of paper, it doesn't matter, but do make sure you capture the names, addresses, and phone numbers of the people you want to, to speak to. Less is definitely more. You know, if you need to, to write down their budget limit or you need to write down their um, special features, please make sure you do that as well, um, because clearly um, these are all important things. Okay. Um, in terms of a summary, I guess I'm reaching the end of my little bit before I hand you over. Uh, and actually what I would say, the most important thing, number one, would be to make sure that you agree those objectives amongst yourselves uh, and make sure that everybody else on the stand understands why you're there. Certainly, I would uh, take advantage of all the PR availability up front. Email people. You know, don't just rely on them turning up. You can always invite your own people. Uh, certainly, uh, try to identify from the total number of visitors how many of them prospects and potential buyers and who are the ones you wish to speak to. Um, and then, again, the more you know about them, the easier it becomes to decide how you're going to encourage them onto your stand, whether you're inviting them or enticing them, as the case may be. Make sure you've got a way of capturing their details so that you can actually record who it was and what they needed. Uh, and, and probably the most important, folks, is please follow up your leads as well. Uh, again, one of the, the, the scary things about this uh, is it's, uh, a lot of this stuff hopefully is common sense. It's just it's not coming back. It's, the more these things you do, uh, I would say the more success you will have. But the final point I'd like to leave you with, if I might, uh, is one that isn't often in the books, uh, but it's one nonetheless that's very important, uh, and that is clearly if you are going to be attending a show and you're going to be exhibiting, please, please, please look like you're having fun. Um, you know, if I if I can see two stands, one one stand looks like they're having fun, they want to be there. The other stand of X is their turn this year, or they're there under duress because someone was sick. I know which one I will approach, uh, and clearly uh, I would leave it up to you guys uh, to assume the same. Okay, that's it from me. Uh, obviously, if you've got any questions, just um, uh, get online and, and let us have your questions, um, and we'll do our best to try and answer them time uh, permitting at the end. Uh, in the meantime, what I'd like to do is to say thank you very much and hand you over to the events team who are going to run from, through some of the specifics with you. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. Well, thanks very much to Simon for all that great advice. Um, just to let you know that this is going to be available on demand after the um, webinar has finished. So if you want to re-listen to any of the advice that he just gave, then make sure that you log in afterwards. Um, so I'm Anna Knight, and I'm the Group Marketing Manager for Facility Show and Safety and Health Expo. And I've got the pleasure of talking to you about this year's Facility Show and what we've got planned for the event. So to start off with some stats, um, I'm delighted to report that once again, Facility Show has continued to build on the phenomenal growth of the past few years, with visitor registrations tracking 25% up on 2012. We'll be welcoming 350 exhibitors on the show floor, utilizing 10,000 square meters of exhibition space, all in all an increase of 28% year on year. Next, I wanted to give you a flavor of our education programs. This year, we'll see the return of some old favorites, including the Facility Show Seminar Theatre, the Biffin CPD Theatre, and the Energy Management Zone and Theatre. All these theatres will take place across the three days of the show and include a mixture of case study content, panel debates, and Q&A sessions. New to 2013 is the launch of the Biffin Networking Hub. The Networking Hub, which we launched at last year's FM event, will host breakfast, lunch, and afternoon briefings on each day of the show for a select group of high-level delegates. These will take the form of strategic roundtable discussions 
and be led by industry experts from the Carbon Trust, MITE, the Chartered Institute of Waste Management, BIFIM, and MAXI. Attendance of this is by invite only. Also new in 2013 is the inclusion of Service Management Expo, Europe's only dedicated event for the field service market. This will be a must attend for professionals working across service management, logistics, fleet management, facilities, operations, finance, and IT, and for the first year ever forms an integral part of the facility show. The expo also includes its own theatre, the Field Service Solutions Theatre, which will showcase all which will showcase across the three days high level specialist content. If you want to have a look at all the latest education programs, all you need to do is go online at facilityshow.com and you'll see them all listed under the Education tab. Finally, I've got a few additional points of interest that I thought you'd like to know about. Make sure you come and have some drinks on us at the Exhibitor Drinks Party on Wednesday the 15th of May, which will be held in conjunction with Safety and Health Expo. This year we're offering prizes for the best space only and shell scheme stands. We're going to launch this initiative tomorrow, so look out for some emails from the Facility Show team. And finally, make sure you rebook your stand early for 2014, because you'll get first choice on stand location at our new home at London Excel. You'll be seeing lots of information about this over the coming weeks, so stay tuned for some more updates. I'm now going to hand you over to Patsy Bateman, who's going to talk to you about Safety and Health Expo. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm going to just quickly talk through Safety and Health Expo, some of the key highlights this year. Um, again, we're returning with uh, full support from uh, IOSH, ROSFA, and BSIF. Um, this year, we are looking at uh, 310 exhibitors, and also visitor registration is already tracking um, a healthy 20% up from 2012, um, and all within a 12,500 square meter exhibition space. Um, we're returning with lots of the popular features that um, proved successful last year, including the AIF working at Height Knowledge Base, the SHP Legal Arena, and Arco Academy and Irish Networks. Um, but following sort of some extensive research that we've been doing in the years since 2012 show, we've looked at kind of areas what that the visitors were saying they were keen to see more of. And so this year we are launching several new features, including the Health and Wellbeing Theatre and the Business Driver Safety Zone, um, which will provide sort of information and uh, focusing on specific areas that visitors have expressed interest in. Um, we've also going to be um, we also have our Exhibitor Lounge, which is sponsored by Maconi Agency, uh, which is located at the crossover point for Facility Show. And this is an opportunity for you to catch up with your exhibitors, other exhibitors, um, relax, and sort of potentially just have a little bit of time away from the, your stands and kind of get a breather away from the show floor. Um, we also will want to make sure that you make the most out of all the networking and social opportunities going on this year. Um, again, BSIF will be doing their award ceremony in the Arco Academy at 3 p.m. on the Tuesday 14th of May. Um, we also have the Barbers Directors Club and the Platinum Club, um, so you can see more information on them on the website. Um, and we will be hosting our drinks with the facility show, um, and we welcome you to those on Wednesday 15th of May. Again, we're going to be hosting prizes for space only and shell scheme stands. Um, so those that we, you know, will be judged as the the best stands this year will receive a prize, and we'll do an award ceremony for those. Um, and finally, for again, similar to the show, make sure you speak to your team regarding rebooking for 2014. Um, we are going to be in our new home of London Excel, and it's key that you know those that are are going to be booking to get there early so that they can ensure of getting the best spots. Um, I'm going to pass you over now to the ISEC and Firex teams who will talk to you a bit more about what's happening at their shows this year. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Poole. I'm the event manager for ISEC. Um, on the scheduling, I think we are down next to the Firex International update, but we um, we're actually going to do this together, um, both on a Firex and a SEC point of view. So um, these slides will be obviously made available. Um, so just to sort of skip between the two, and you'll be able to see um, just some of the headings that we're going to cover this afternoon. So um, as I say, good afternoon. Um, again, once again, I am the event manager for IFSEC. Um, I've got the pleasure in offering a brief overview to this year's event um, that will hopefully help um, everyone with 
um, your own preparation. Um, kicking off with some of the latest stats, um, to date we have nearly 600 exhibits in companies, a utilization of over 34,000 square meters of exhibition floor space, and currently over 8,000 pre-registered pre visitors um, to the show, which is tracking um, an amazing 11% ahead year on year. Um, and in addition to this, we've also got up um, about 150 hours of free education. So FSEC's 40th edition this year is going to be a busy one indeed. Um, some further show news, um, and as the convergence of fire and security becomes even greater, um, you'll be very pleased to hear that we've actually taken away the old crossover points for the first time in 2013. So basically this will allow visitors between the shows much easier access between both FSEC and FireX, um, resulting in a greater flow of traffic over the four days. Now, bridging both, both of those events, um, we're actually going to be launching a new product area um, aimed, at a rapidly growing, sorry, aimed at our rapidly growing end user audience attending both the shows. Um, this new product area, which is titled Intelligent Buildings, will be sponsored by Cortec Developments and will focus heavily on systems convergence, data-led building management, and key sustainability solutions. It also comes as no surprise that education um, also forms an, an integral part of IFSEC with no fewer than seven theatres across the show um, that make up our IFSEC Academy. Packed full of high level content with the best industry and the independent speakers on hand to share their knowledge and expertise. Working with many key industry partners such as the BSIA, ASIS, the Security Institute, Annexter and TAVCOM Training. There will also be CPD and CPE points available to attend these to a number of these free education sessions. I'm just going to hand you over briefly to Jerry Dunphy, who's the Sales Director on International FireX, to provide an update. Thank you, Peter. Um, with regard to uh, FireX International 2013, um, we'll have over 150 exhibiting companies uh, from the UK and overseas, uh, taking up just over 10,000 square meters of exhibition space. Um, it's a really eclectic mix of uh, fire alarms, uh, detectors, extinguishers, suppression systems, passive fire protection training standards and approvals and provides a very, very strong emphasis on expertise and guidance in all things to do with, with life safety. Currently, um, in terms of pre-registrations, um, we're 29% ahead of where we were in 2011, which is absolutely superb. Um, we have over 3,000 visitors pre-registered for FireX, but don't forget um, a vast proportion of them also do transfer over from IFSEC, which is uh, part of the, uh, the benefit of the co-location with the, the other events. Uh, visitors themselves are an intriguing mix of fire alarm installers, fire safety engineers, consultants, and a range of end users, never growing range, from major private and public sector institutions such as retail, finance, healthcare, hotels, and leisure. Um, as in previous years, we're very pleased to be working in association with the Fire Industry Association, um, which again is the official sponsor of Fire Act International and will be assisting us with things like promoting the event to members and also helping us out with the uh, seminar program within the FireX Academy. I'll just pass you back to Pete. Thanks, Jerry. Um, next up on the IFSEC side, um, we just wanted to sort of touch base on the websites that we have for the, for the event. Um, IFSEC.co.uk and FireX.co.uk are the official show websites where all our visitors come to register to attend to the show. The site themselves provide the visitor with all the information they need to plan their time at the show, including, importantly, all the details of, of all of our exhibitors, as well as the comprehensive education offered through the IFSEC Academy. It is, also, it's, it is very important that every exhibitor um, updates their online profile on here, um, adding as much detail as possible, which will assist in raising your profile through the visitor base. And my colleague, um, Ruth Galpine, will talk to you um, briefly on this later on throughout the presentation. Um, in addition to ifsec.co.uk, earlier this year we launched um, ifsecglobal.com, the new online community for security and fire safety professionals. After very thorough research with our community, this new platform now provides market-leading content and community engagement all year round, offering expert opinion, free-to-download free to white papers, video reviews, research, and webinars. So whether you have an interest in contributing um, through various thought leadership pieces or simply raising your company profile to a monthly audience reach of over 40,000, um, please contact um, one of your IFSEC or FireX account managers for further detail. Moving on to the IFSEC Academy for 2013, um, I've already briefly touched upon the IFSEC Academy in, in my opening introduction. However, just to add some further detail, um, the IFSEC Academy um, we created as an umbrella brand for all of our education theatres at all of our events globally high-quality, targeted, and relevant in education catering for all of our visitor segments, 
that is delivered via research insight, case studies, panel debates, and interactive Q&A, all of which have been designed with our visitors in mind and how they like to digest information. We have education theatres targeted at specific visitor segments, technologies, and solutions, as well as the big keynote, keynote ses sessions on the IFSEC Centre Stage Theatre. We place a huge importance on the quality of our education as a major draw to the show, and what's, and what's more, all this content is absolutely free to attend. Jerry will now just give you a brief insight to the FireX Academy. Thank you, Peter. Um, the FireX Academy is, is um, different to IFSEC, also it focuses on everything to do with, with fire. Um, it's situated in Hall 3 and focuses on a range of key areas within fire safety, such as fire risk assessment, construction products regulations, fire service charging and trading, and false alarm reduction. And we're also very, very pleased to announce exclusively that we've got a major panel discussion hosted by the Fire Sector Federation on the findings from the recent Lacknall House inquest, which concluded only two weeks ago. So there's a bit of a scoop, that one. Um, our seminar program aims to provide high-caliber education and training for installers and end users, and we work very closely with groups such as the F FIA and ASFP to deliver an unparalleled series of presentations, all free of charge to the visitors, of course. In addition uh, to the Fire Risk Academy, the ASFP Pavilion will provide expert advice on passive fire protection, and the LPCB Redbook Pavilion will assist with third-party approval queries, product testing, and installer schemes. Um, we've also got the FPA um, taking part with their InfoZone stand, and they'll have a range of seminars mm -hmm. taking place and uh, throughout the week um, based on major things such as fire risk assessment and the findings of, of uh, various tragic fires. Um, I'll just hand you back to Peter again, who will discuss the effect week. Thanks, Jerry. So um, there's plenty happening um, right across the week, the week um, not to mention, obviously, every evening um, of the week as well. So just a couple of um, events that I'd like to highlight to you. Um, the Monday night um, are the FSEC Awards, which take place at the Hilton NEC Metropole. And just to note, there are still a few tickets remaining should you like to join around um, 500 industry fire and security professionals. Um, Tuesday night, um, we've actually labelled this this year um, for the first time as the official night for exhibitor parties um, on your own stands at the NEC, um, and an inquiry form will be made live um, very soon through the exhibitor zone should you wish to party. Um, and finally, on the Wednesday night, um, we'll be launching our Installers Live party, and that will be headlined London Calling. Um, which actually leads me um, on very nicely to the future of IFSEC. Um, I think I've mentioned it there as IFSEC the future. Um, and the very exciting news that we announced several weeks ago, um, that from 2014, IFSEC's new home will become the Excel Arena in London. Um, our announcement came after 12 months of extensive re research with our visitors and exhibitors and what they would like to see from IFSEC International in the future. Our new home will cater for even more visitors, representing our very loyal trade visitors, our increase in end user visitors, as well as becoming even more accessible to our international visitors. Furthermore, it also allows us to, com to completely re-engineer the show to become, to become an even greater appeal to all visiting segments, with exciting plans soon to be announced for installers, integrators, and end users. All of this, as well as the inter interconnection between all of our events will make both visiting and exhibiting even more rewarding than previous years. It's also a very exciting time for FireX as 2014 marks the return of the show to an annual status. Uh, the move to London sees the co-locations of this set, the facilities show and Safety and Health Expo uh, providing us with a formidable platform form to return FireX to a proper yearly cycle so it effectively will remove the confusion experienced by visitors when FireX had an off year. Moving on to the IFSEC Global events, just wanted to, um, sort of the, the final point for me to cover today, and just wanted to highlight to those who may have an interest in growing their export business, um, and for those of you that don't know, um, IFSEC now operates on a global scale in India, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Turkey, and the Ukraine, and should you have any interest in any of these, again, please contact um, your IFSEC account manager. So. All that is left for me to say is that I sincerely wish you all every success at the upcoming shows at the NEC. Um, there are still five weeks to go. Should you need any help or guidance, please ensure you contact us to assist. It is as important for us that your time at our shows is both enjoyable and rewarding to you and your business. Thank you once again for listening, and I'll hopefully see most of you in May. And for now, I'll pass you over to Ruth Galpine, who is our Group Marketing Manager for the Protection and Management Week. 
Oh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ruth Galpine. I am the Group Marketing Manager for IFSEC Second FireX, as Pete just mentioned. I'd like to take the next um, few minutes along with Patsy to run through the marketing and PR opportunities that are available to you free of charge as an exhibitor. Um, the benefits that I'm going to run through are actually for um, exhibitors at all four events. We appear to be just having a little hitch with our slides here. Um, I hope that you can all see the first slide we've got here entitled Marketing and PR Opportunities. Um, perhaps the operator, if you could just um, operate the slides for us over the next few minutes until we come back online. Thank you. So before we get started on specific activities, um, it's worth highlighting that some research conducted by the AEO again shows that 83% of the most successful companies at exhibitions actually had contacted their customers and prospects before the show. Well, we're obviously working very hard to promote all of our exhibitors at the events to attract visitors, if you do want to stand out from the hundreds of other um, exhibitors and your competitors, then it is vital that you shout about the fact you're going to be there. In, some, in simple terms, just adding a line such as the one you can hopefully see on the slide, um, such as, you know, so something like, we're exhibiting, what your stand number is, the show dates, and the website URL is a good starting point. But also remembering to tell your teams, make sure that they're including it in any conversations they're having over the next six weeks. Um, why exhibiting is a good thing, all of the benefits associated with it, so they can meet you in person to ask any questions, touch and see the live products, watch any live demos, and also make direct comparison with the competition. So on to the next slide. Um, the first place to start, if you haven't already, is on the exhibition website. Hopefully you've all been sent login details to the exhibitor zone. If you haven't received these, then do please let us know and we'll have them resent to you. When you log into the exhibitor zone, you'll see a welcome page, such as the one you can hopefully see highlighted here. It gives you options to visit the Marketing and PR Guide, the Technical Manual, and also to submit your event guide entry. The Marketing and PR Guide is where all of the forms, checklists, and tips that we're about to go through are stored. The Technical Manual is where all of the essential information for operations and logistics, which Louise will go through shortly, live. And the Event Guide is obviously to submit your 50-word entry for the show guide. And you can see the links to each event's exhibitor zone, hopefully, on the screen now. If you are having trouble seeing the um, slides as well, then we'll make sure these are available after the um, presentation. So once you've logged in, the next thing you need to do is um, build your web profile. This is obviously what visitors see when they view the exhibitor list on the show website. It is, in essence, your own microsite to host as much content as you like. You can upload your logo, a 50-word description, and contact details. And then for exhibitors with the enhanced web profile, you can add a wealth of content, including press releases, white papers, marketing materials, your social media accounts and profile details, and also any video content you want to upload. You can see on the example shown um, an exhibitor who's done just that, and hopefully the icons that you can see um, represent the type of materials that this exhibitor has uploaded. When you click on the company name, you go through to their microsite, and you can see all of their information. So as part of your web profile, you'll also be asked to select up to 10 product areas and one main product category. The product areas and categories serve two purposes. They are how visitors will find you in the search facility on the website, and they're also how you'll be listed by products within the event guide. It's essential that you select all that apply to your business, but also that you keep it relevant. Also within the Marketing PR Guide, you'll find the online checklist. This is a checklist of all of the pre-show marketing PR items that you've completed so far, and also any that are outstanding. You can use this as your founding board of what you still have to do in the run-up to the event. Or if you're not sure or have any questions, you can just drop us a line as well, and we can help you out. So hopefully on the next um, slide you can see that um, across all of our four events we run an enhanced visitor experience for our top tier attendees. It's the VIP Club on If Second Fire X and the Platinum Club on Facility Show and Safety and Health Expo. As always, we identify and upgrade our top level pre-reg through a careful process of examination and meeting key criteria, but we also offer the opportunity to our exhibitors to invite up to 20 of your clients or prospects to attend the events as VIPs. This has proved to be a really popular service in the past as it demonstrates to your chosen customers the value that they represent to you. You simply need to complete the form within the technical manual with your 20 nominees details and then we will contact them on your behalf with our VIP or Platinum Club marketing campaign and invite them to attend as VIPs or Platinum Club on your specific request. The VIP um, Platinum offering varies from show to show but all are treated to access to an exclusive lounge where they can hold quiet meetings, escape the busy show floor, receive complimentary refreshments, and also benefit from free car parking whilst at the exhibition. So then on to specifics. In terms of specific marketing activities we would encourage you to undertake, they are as follows. You can order your e-tickets or e-invitations. These are personalized to your company with your logo and stand number, and we supply them to you as HTML files so that you can invite your customers and prospects to attend on your request. We provide trackable registration links so that afterwards we can tell you how many and who has registered from them. 
We also provide personalized banners. Um, hopefully you can see on the slide a couple of examples highlighted here that show where we've taken the exhibition online banner creative and inserted your exhibitor name and stand number onto them. We can provide them in various dimensions and file formats for you to then use across your websites or e-newsletters or anywhere else that you'd like to feature them. You can also request the event logo. Again, we have the event logos in a variety of different dimensions and formats uh, for you to use on your emails, your website, and even in printed materials such as adverts, wherever you would like to say that you're exhibiting. Simply let us know what you need and we will send them to you. Um, hopefully on the next slide you can see the email footer. Uh, this is a very simple thing to do, but it's also very effective. It doesn't need to be too complicated. A simple line saying that you're exhibiting where and when, and then with a link to the event website is sufficient. Um, but you can, of course, add a logo or personalized web banner here if you wish to. And then finally, the online inbox. Within your online web profile, you're also given an inbox that visitors to the website can use to contact you. Make sure you check it regularly to pick up any messages from visitors who may be wanting to arrange to meet you on site. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now pass you over to Patsy, who will run through the PR opportunities with you. Um, and if you do have any questions on marketing, um, just submit them using the questions box, and we will get onto them at the end. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Pat Bateman, PR Manager for Safety and Health Expo and Facility Show. Um, I'll run through PR activity and opportunities for all four shows, including Firex and um, ISFIC International. Um, as you can see on the slide for PR activity, you will have contact details for both myself and Natasha Marsh, who is the contact for anyone working on ISFIC and Firex for any PR activity. Um, and that's what I'd like to start with, is saying if you have any questions regarding PR media relations at any time in the run-up to the show, then please feel free to contact us and we can help with um, sort of answering any of those queries or putting you in touch with the relevant people or you know hopefully helping out in that way because I know that a lot of the time you may not sort of know as of yet what you may be announcing or what you might be quite doing. Um, the third thing I'd say is make the most of your website of the website for your show on um, by submitting press releases for the news section. These are updated regularly and we can put up on there what's going on in the industry and so anyone visiting who's planning to attend can see exactly what you're doing and what news you've announced recently. Um, we also work with a digital press pack um, that we distribute to all media that come to our press office um, on the show floor. So for this, it'd be if you could submit your kind of company profile or any press releases you have or particularly images, then, then we can hand this out to media if they're looking to get a bit more ex information on exhibitors and find out who was there and what they had and what sort of images they had. So that's something that we can provide them with, but we do need this sent to us in advance so we can make sure this is on the digital press pack for distribution at the show. Um, we do advise not to send anything more than four megabytes because obviously there's a lot of exhibitors taking part and we don't actually have space for everyone to sort of send much more than that. Um, um, I think the key thing to remember as well is just that the more you let people and media know in advance of what you're planning to do at the show, the more chance you have of engaging with them and helping them to plan the time and see and engage with you at the event. Um, just moving on to the next slide, um, I, another thing that's quite important for you to make sure you do is to notify either myself or Natasha of any competitions, promotions or events that you are planning to do on your sh on your stand or at the event. Um, if you can let us know, then we can look to see if we can fit anything in within the event guide, event preview, or even within some of our own press releases to sort of highlight any key activity that's going on on the show floor. We also are engaged with media throughout the run-up to the show, so the more we we have an understanding of what is going on at the show, then we can let them know and give them timings and location and ensure that they're, they're fully up to date of what is happening within the show floor and all their activity. Um, um, let me just, sorry. Yep. And following on to that, the other thing, to, the key area will be is actually making sure that you're engaged in the conversations during the show. So we have several social media um, we have social media pages for each of our shows, and we will be following the hashtags, which should be up on the slide that you see now, which is ISFEC, FireX, She Expo, and Fact Show. Um, again, to make this engaging and interesting, and to keep sort of the conversation going on the social media sites, make sure you're uploading pictures, images, videos, or blog posts, or anything that actually is putting it in real time for the show. This helps people feel as if they're actually part of something in the community and they're in that conversation. Um, 
if you're joining the conversation, it makes people realize that this is a live event that they very much want to be part of. Um, additionally, if you are planning to do anything, invite key journalists um, to attend your stand, get engaged with you guys. If you are doing any briefings or press launches or conferences, make sure you invite the media to attend and be ready to answer any questions they may have around this new, new product. Um, again, just make sure that you're, you're fully kind of up to date with everything you're doing. Make sure you follow up with um, any sort of media interviews you have and that you can can sort of make sure you get the contact for any media that comes to your stand, you follow up with them and you give them all the information that they request in a timely manner because they'll be, they'll be working towards kind of strict deadlines following up from the show and they'll be wanting to write about what they've seen, heard or experienced at the show and the more information that you can give them and the more ways that you can illustrate that, the better and more likely you are to be included in any of that coverage. Um, it, again, as I said earlier, if you have any questions regarding media or PR around the shows, then please contact either myself and Natasha, and we'll be happy to help you. Um, I'm going to pass over to Louise now, who should be able to answer all, well, give you sort of details on the operations and logistics of the event. And if, again, if you have any questions, then please feel free to put them in the questions and answers. Hello everyone, my name is Louise O'Connell, I'm the Operations Manager across the series of shows that we've been talking about today. Um, I just wanted to do a brief run through with you all um, with regarding the technical online manual that will be the sort of mainstay of helping you through the, the technical aspects of exhibiting with us. You will have already received, hopefully, your username and password to the Exhibitor Zone. This is where all the details for the marketing um, bits and pieces that we've just been talking through previously are held. Once you've logged on here, there's an aspect that you can click down into the online manual. So this is basically all the technical information that you would possibly need for the show. It's a huge amount. It's quite a lot to read, but um, we'd love to sort of introduce it to you and um, talk you through it just in case there's any you know, questions. The main page that you'll first see when you log on, and hopefully on the slide that you'll be looking at, is um, one here as an example for the FireX and IFSEC online manual. This is the main page. It looks slightly different to previous years, so I hope it hasn't been too difficult, difficult to get used to. The main page is basically a shortcut to all the information that you could see in the manual. So the first one on the left would be My Checklist. Now, this My Checklist is where all the forms and order or web websites that you would need to get through to order the bits and pieces you need to exhibit with us are held. This is a, a portal to different websites for our contractors. But you should be able to see here a list of all the forms the ones that are important that we, we mark the big exclamation mark, the ones that are opt, um, you can opt into or you don't need to, to do at all, um, and also the deadline dates and the amount of dates that you have to run down to. So here is basically the, the sort of one-stop shop, hopefully, for everything that you could need. Below that is the event timetable tab. Um, this will show you all the, the dates for build-up, breakdowns, so the different types of stands that you have, um, plus the hours of the show open times. Below that is the contacts tab. That's where hopefully everyone that you could possibly need to talk to is listed. There's ourselves, the, the team that you're dealing with at UBM, and also all our contractors for the individual shows. So hopefully all their details would be there if you needed to contact them directly with any specific queries. Moving around the box, we have um, an on-site tab here. So this is just a sort of general information for any sort of random queries or any sort of um, bits and pieces that you might need to know about being on-site in general. This is followed by the Shell Scheme and Space Only tabs. Now, I've, the slide's following on shortly after, just to sort of describe what a Shell Scheme and what a Space Only are. Sorry if you do know this, but sometimes it just helps to sort of go back to basics a little bit. Shell Scheme is something that we will sell to you and we build for you. So that involves the carpet, the walls, and the fascia name board. This um, is ready for you when you turn up on site. Um, and any extras that you want to order for this, say electrics, if you wanted some lighting or power or any furniture, can also be ordered through the manual. But hopefully you would turn up on site and your shell scheme stand would be ready to go for you. A space only is slightly different. We basically just mark out a place for you on the venue floor. So this is, tends to be when you would uh, employ a contractor excuse me, to come in to build the stand for you. We would ask you and them to read all the space only build regulations that we host in the online manual just to ensure that everything is correct and in place and compliant to any health and safety regulations that we have. The technical plans for your stands um, we would like to see as well. We need to have those submitted with your method statement, risk assessment um, for building the actual stand. Um, we will give permission to build once we're satisfied with the levels of 
um, health and safety and you know, the technical aspects there. But this is something that contractors tend to speak to us with and our plan approval company who are called International Select Events. Following that round off the tab, there's a tab on the venue, so just some ven um, venue information on the NEC that you might possibly need. Then there's the health and safety tab, which is the, the long and detailed one that we would ask you and your contractors just to cast your eyes over. And then the final tab at the top right is the help and freak frequently asked questions. So please have a look there. If you can't find the information that you need to, please do get in touch with myself or any of my colleagues. Um, a final slide that I just want to sort of talk through is um, when you are ready to sort of turn up on site, and a question we get asked quite a lot is about which passes and um, vehicle IDs that you would need. So we'd just like to say that if you have an exhibitor badge that you've applied for on your team, this is valid through the whole time. So during build-up, during the open times, and, and the breakdowns, you don't need any other passes apart from those ones. The contractor wristbands we do, um, they're handed out on site, on arrival, and these are the contractors that are just there for build-up and breakdown. So we, we gauge them going through, in and out of security, just to make sure they're in the right place at the right time. The vehicle ID pass is a PDF form that you can download from the checklist. You can print this off, just complete it, pop it in your windscreen on arrival, and the traffic marshals will hopefully direct you to the, the correct hall and vehicle access door. We are all on site, obviously, just throughout the duration of the show. We'll be based in the organizer's office in Hall 4 for IFSEC and FireX, and in Hall 2 for safety and facilities. So please do pop in and see us if you have any queries, and our on-site team will be there. Just on the bottom of the last slide, hopefully you'll see my email address if you need any queries, and also Georgina Ray who's working on facilities and safety and health. That concludes all my slides. We're just wondering if you have any questions, please use the next couple of minutes just to log on and ask any questions, and we will hopefully be able to get back to you shortly. Thank you very much for listening and your time today.